Thanks for tuning in to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us. You know, when you're doing the same thing every year, you say, oh, okay, it's a cornfield, next year it's a soybean field. You, you kind of get the feel of how to manage that. But when something's been in CRP for 15 or 20 years, okay, there may be some questions here. <laughs> so we're going to talk about ground that's coming out of CRP or coming into production that hasn't been in production before. All right, we talk a lot on Ag PhD about N, P, and K. We also talk about some of the macro nutrients, the secondary nutrients like sulfur and calcium and even magnesium. But today we wanted to focus on a micronutrient that we need so little, Darren, you're probably not even going to think this is any big issue, but I think it's a huge issue across most of the country. So we want to talk about boron today. Well, we're going to talk about a tough to control weed of the week, but first here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we wanted to answer the question, why do farmers like cold temperatures? Well, there's a lot of farmers that don't, Brian. In fact, we could call Dad down in Arizona right now. He's <laughs> probably having lunch with a bunch of other farmers down there trying to avoid the cold okay, weather. Okay, so I just want to clarify this. This is not why they like cold temperatures to live in, because obviously <laughs> not a lot of people like that. But the reason why farmers like cold temperatures, I mean, it comes down to a bunch of things, but basically, if we can get the ground really cold, that changes a lot of things. It kills a lot of things in that soil and even compaction, Darren. It will influence compaction to some degree. When you're talking about compaction, what you're talking about, Brian, is the freeze-thaw activity in the soil. When we get good amount of moisture down into the soil and it freezes, it will, it will swell. Just like if you have water that freezes in a water bottle and a lot of times you'll see that bottle explode or pop the top off it. You have the same kind of activity going on in the soil. So when you get that freeze-thaw activity, if you have a hard compacted layer, if there's some moisture that's in that compaction zone, you could actually break up the compaction a little bit. It's not a huge thing, but but a little bit can be helpful. Yep, what I look at even more though is killing bugs. There are a lot of different methods to killing bugs, but this is the simplest and easiest method that I know. We're just gonna freeze them. And if we can do that, if we can get that frost going way down deep in the ground, we have a lot fewer bug problems the following year, most often. It's not a, you know, a for sure thing again, but I really like that deep freeze in terms of insect control. Well, the other thing about cold is it gets rid of a lot of weeds. You know, you think about some of the weeds that are bad in the southern part of the United States, we don't fight those weeds up in the north because we freeze in the winter and we freeze hard. Now, there are certainly some species of trees that can't survive in the north and this kind of thing that, you know, I wish I could have fruit trees in my yard, but outside of apple trees, there aren't very many fruit trees that grow very well here. Uh, but there are certainly a lot of weeds that we don't have to fight when we have cold winters. Same thing with diseases. There are a lot of diseases that farmers in the southern United States have to fight. We don't really have those issues in the northern part of the country. Rust is the big one that I would just briefly mention. We see rust in a whole bunch of different crops. We might see it in corn or soybeans or wheat. There are all different kinds of rust too. And for the most part, those don't survive in the northern U.S because of our cold temperatures. So the only way we get rust here is they have this rust has to blow in from the southern United States. So the colder the temperatures get, the better off we are. And the further south those cold temperatures get, the better off we are in terms of preventing disease problems the following year. Well, for farmers, when the temperatures get warm in the summer and cold in the winter, some people think, ah, that's terrible for them. They've got to fight all these changing conditions. Actually, there are a lot of benefits to the four seasons happening. And when we get a cold winter, uh, like, you know, I hope we never have, but <laughs> if, for me personally, but out in my fields, it's kind of a nice thing sometimes to help control diseases, insects, and weeds for farmers. Hey, one last thing I was going to mention on this freeze-thaw thing. If we can get a deep frost down in the ground, what it also will do is freeze tile lines, and then we will not have water going out our tile lines some years on our farm until mid-May. So when that happens, we have a lot of people who are concerned about, oh, adding tile is going to create flooding. Well, when do we normally have flooding? It happens in the early spring, March, April, that kind of thing. And we just don't see that usually because the frost gets deep enough. So we encourage farmers to put their tie lines in at three feet deep. Usually those tie lines will freeze up in the wintertime and we don't have any water going out at times of the year, like really early in the spring when we have issues with flooding. Well, the other thing about those cold winter months, Brian, is our weed of the week has a tough time growing. Can you identify this week's weed? 
There are more mouths to feed than ever before. What are farmers doing to meet the challenge? They're using agronomically designed equipment from Case IH. Our Quattrec technology, soil management, and planting systems are designed to foster a better growing environment that helps farmers maximize yield potential. And our deep understanding of agriculture is preparing them for the challenges ahead. Will you be ready? I'm ready. Go to caseih.com to learn more. Supercharge your phosphorus with Avail. Add Avail to the phosphorus in your starter and see an average increase of 7.8 bushel per acre. Studies show that when added to the phosphorus in your starter application, Avail promotes more efficient pea uptake for stronger roots, better overall plant health, and higher yields come harvest. Supercharge your phosphorus and your yield potential this spring with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Ask your fertilizer dealer for details today. For lower costs and higher production, Mandaco leads with versatility unmatched. Twister is the vertical tillage unit for no-till as well as conventional tillage. Twister's ease of maintenance is forgiving in rocks and has contour conformity equaling zero downtime. Our hydraulically adjusted coulter angles make residue management easier and less costly. Spring or fall, the Mandaco Twister vertical tillage unit is the new leader. See your Mandaco dealer. Visit northcountrymarketing.biz or call 877-915-8790. You can't fill a barrel any fuller than its lowest stave. And your crops can't do any better than the nutrient that's in shortest supply. Your yield potential is only as good as the weakest nutrient in your fertilizer program. Give your crops more than just NPK. Prescription apply all the micronutrients your crop needs. Each one customized for your crop's potential. Microlink, linking yield to potential. For years, FarmLogic has been the easiest and most convenient way to keep up with your farming operations. Well, it just got better. Introducing FarmPad for your phone. You always have your phone with you, so entering records as they happen is as easy as a touch of a button. Chemical database, GPS, service records, and more. When you do it on the farm, save it on your phone and it's backed up forever. Call or visit FarmLogic.com for a free trial and find out why FarmLogic is the best decision tool for the farm. A few years ago when we were doing soil tests on our farm, we realized, ooh, we don't have a lot of boron in the soil. And I just thought, well, how much so do what? you really need? Exactly. So what? Well, the problem then was we were also doing some plant tissue analysis and sample after sample after sample, we kept coming up deficient on boron. That's not a good thing. Well, kind of, Brian. You know, early in the season, if you're short on boron, how much boron do you really need in the early season? You need it mostly around pollination time yep. and right around reproductive phases of most crops. And with boron, it's one of those nutrients, and here's one of the unique things about it, it's actually leachable. It's one of those nutrients that can move down with water in your soil. So maybe you get some rains in the spring, it pushes the boron down a little bit, you still got a shot of getting it back later or reaching that level where the boron is with your roots. But do you really want to take a chance? So what I always talk to people about is with nitrogen, for example, you would never even think about planting corn or wheat without adding nitrogen to the field, would you? Well, it's kind of the same deal with boron. Why do you have to put nitrogen out every time you're gonna raise those grass crops? Because nitrogen will leach down in the soil. You know it's gonna be gone if you don't use it that year, right? Same thing happens with boron in a lot of cases. This is something you should be fertilizing with every year, Yet, as farmers, we think about NPK, NPK. How many people think about putting boron out on their fields every year? I'd get a lot of laughter at a farmer meeting if I bring that up. Well, you know, some farmers do actually think about boron, Brandon, and it's mostly the alfalfa growers. Because alfalfa growers understand that boron is very important to raising a good alfalfa crop. When I was just getting started as an agronomist, uh, one of my customers said, you know, yeah, I'm getting some fertilizer put on my alfalfa today, and and I'm having the guys add in some boron. And I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. And he was telling me about how important it was in his alfalfa crop. And I knew a little bit about it, but, but it was interesting to hear it from somebody who was really passionate about the issue. And anyway, I talked to him uh, you know, a couple of weeks later and I, I said, all right, you know, how, how are things going? He goes, oh man, you won't believe this. I killed a bunch of my alfalfa. And I said, what happened? Did you spray some Roundup over there or, or what, what actually killed it? He said, well, remember that boron I was telling you about? Yeah, the company that I was gonna have put that on, they just dumped a bunch of boron in with the rest of my fertilizer and the boron was real small and the rest of the fertilizer pellets were kind of big. The boron shifted all down to the bottom of the spreader 
and the first 100 yards coming out uh, at the start of my field was all the boron. It was so much boron, it actually killed my crop. It was toxic to my crop at that high level. Well, everything that was gonna go on 100 acres of alfalfa went on 100 yards instead. <laughs> yes, you can't have too much of a good thing. So I've used Darren's story exactly when I've been training young agronomists, and I just said, okay, think about what I've told you now with boron. We know it's leachable, and so if you had a whole bunch of boron that ended up on 100 yards of a particular field, what should you do? Well, when you think about it just a little bit, all you really need to do is just just try to flush that down with water. If you can get that down below the root zone, you hopefully should be able to keep your alfalfa going. Well, you've got that, or you've got another choice. You've got a, a dead strip there, 100 feet long and 50 feet wide, the, the width of that spreader. Well, all he could have done too is gone in and just scraped off the top three or four inches of that yep. soil and spread it out across the whole field. Now he's taken all that boron and spread it out evenly over the whole field. If you could do that, that would be another alternative and, and something positive so you can move forward right away. So when you look at boron, we don't want you to just go throw some boron pellets in with a whole bunch of other dry fertilizer and have what Darren described happen to you. In a lot of cases, you're gonna be looking at liquid alternatives with boron. Well, and with the liquid alternatives, Brian, a lot of times you'll see a blend of micronutrients. And this is one thing that's really important. When you're talking about micros, yeah, you can throw out straight zinc. And there's a lot of guys that say, oh, I'm gonna throw straight zinc on my corn. And now that we're doing more plant tissue analysis and many farmers across the country are using that technology too, they say, wow, I'm short on zinc and boron. So I'll throw a little zinc and a little boron in and I'll be good. Well, yeah, you can do that, but the consistency of your results is almost always better when you're using a blend of micronutrients. It's, it's kind of like if there's one piece of pizza, uh, if I eat it all, Brian gets none and now we've got a problem and Brian's hungry. But if we can split it and do it right and blend it together, hey, everything works out fine. Well, I don't think one piece of pizza between the two of us would cut it, Darren. Well, maybe one but... pizza. How about that? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so here is exactly what we want you to do. First of all, we want you to understand how much boron each crop you're raising takes. You're going to find that out if you go to the agphd.com website, go to our resources tab. Otherwise, you can download the fertilizer removal app. It's a free app that we've got at Ag PhD. You can download that uh, at the app store on iTunes. Once you've done that, we want you to soil test, we want you to use plant tissue analysis, and we want you to strongly consider using at least a little bit of boron every single year because boron is leachable. Well, the other thing you need to do every single year is control our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? In the world of four-wheel drive tractors, there is no name more powerful than Steiger. The newest addition to the powerful Case IH Steiger line is the Steiger Row Track, available at Titan Machinery. Designed for row crop use, the Row Track provides more maneuverability and reduces compaction while maintaining power and performance. It's available with 16, 18, or 24-inch tracks for row spacing as narrow as 20 inches. Visit your Titan Machinery dealer today to learn more about the Case IH Steiger Row Track. Titan Machinery, better solutions. Only the Liberty Link system combines the yield potential growers want with reliable weed control they need. The performance of the beans uh, I've been really satisfied with. Overall, the bean uh, had a 64 bushel average. Uh, the full season beans we grew averaged 70. So I was extremely satisfied with the performance of the bean, the quality of the bean. I think that we have to have the Liberty Link system to keep growing beans in the South. Uh, and probably in the whole nation or else the, the resistance issue is going to just uh, take many acres out of production. And that's one reason that I've incorporated the Liberty Link system into my farming program is where I don't end up with a resistance problem. They've uh, yielded right with conventional varieties, Roundup varieties. Uh, as far as yield and, and ease of use, I haven't had any problem at all. They worked out real good. Brought to you by the Liberty Lake Trait and Liberty Herbicide. Your link to higher yield starts with outstanding weed control. Back in 1966, Advanced Drainage Systems, Inc. was the first company to start manufacturing plastic agricultural drainage pipe in the United States. And today, ADS continues our leadership with superior pipe production and service capabilities. Our roots are firmly entrenched in the agriculture industry, and we're committed to helping farmers grow their business. With 54 manufacturing plants and 24 distribution yards throughout the world, you can count on ADS and our green striped pipe to be there when you need us. Advanced Drainage Systems, the green striped pipe you can count on. Looking to maximize yield? QuickRoots is a microbial seed inoculant that allows the plant root to explore a greater volume of soil, the key to higher yields. 
Quick Roots continues to generate yield response on corn, soybeans, wheat, and more. Quick Roots is applied to the seeds so the live microorganisms go right to work, enhancing seedling vigor, increasing the uptake of certain nutrients, including NPK, and expanding root volume. Maximize yield on your farm this season. Call TJ Technologies or your local dealer and get your Quick Roots today. Over the last few years, there have been a lot of CRP acres that have started to go back into crop production. Now, before we talk about this ground coming out of CRP and how to raise a great crop there, let me just first comment on, there are a lot of non-farmers who say, oh, you farmers are taking all this new ground and putting it into production. I'm like, no, we're not even back to ground zero yet. We took a whole bunch of ground out of production about 30 years ago, and we've still got 30 million acres, roughly, of CRP left in this country. That ground was all farmed at one point. Well, and, and there's a difference too, Brian. There's some ground that, in my opinion, probably should stay in CRP. It's yep. ground that's highly erodible or or it, it's just Next not... Next to a river or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's just something that really isn't uh, productive farm ground nine years out of ten. Then again, there's some ground that's highly productive ground that, for whatever reason, somebody said, you know... The, the payment's pretty good from the government <laughs> right. on the CRP. Came down to dollars and I, cents. I'm just going to take the cash. And, you know, on some of that ground, hey, it would be a lot better use for, really, for everybody if it came back into production and raised some food. Okay, the most important thing we want to stress with this ground that was in CRP is you've had, who knows, 10, 15, maybe 30 years where you've been, in effect, building this ground up. The organic matter levels have been going up. You've maintained your soil in there, you've built topsoil, that's all good stuff. So we just don't want to see it go back to where it was before, lowering organic matter, losing topsoil, that type of thing. So we strongly encourage you, don't do a lot of tillage when you're starting to put crop into that CRP ground. Now I realize you might have to do some tillage to level off some of the mounds that might have been created there, uh, fill in some of the badger holes and that kind of thing but try to avoid full-scale tillage there if you can. Well, you've got an opportunity here because, frankly, you know, for most of this ground, it's not going to go out of production again for another 20 or 30 years. So you have to make important decisions now. The other thing is burning off residue. I really don't like to see residue burned off unless it's a, an absolute last resort because, again, you've got all this organic matter you've built up, and now you've got this organic material on top of the ground that will eventually become organic matter, and, and it serves such a valuable purpose in terms of uh, preventing erosion and soil loss. Uh, I think it'd be great if you could keep it and somehow manage it with that residue out there. Yeah, and just understand, when you burn residue, you've now lost most of the nitrogen that was in that residue. You've lost a bunch of the potassium and the phosphorus and some of the other nutrients. So you don't want to burn residue unless you absolutely have to. Well, anyway, perhaps the biggest question we get with this ground coming out of CRP is, what crop should I plant in there first? So it depends kind of on what your CRP mix was. If it was mostly grass, then I would try to raise a broadleaf crop, something like soybeans, for example, where I can control grasses very easily. Well, Roundup Ready Soybeans would be a better answer, Brian, because now you have that option that I've got Roundup there because some of those grasses that you've got out there are going to be pretty tough to kill because well, they're, they're perennial grasses. Yeah. And, and Roundup is really the best thing because it's going to get down into the roots and kill all those growing points. The other side of that is if you want to have better grass control on those perennial grasses, don't do tillage. Once you chop up that root system, those perennials have rhizomes, and they're going to shoot up new sprouts with every little chunk of root that you just cut off. So leave the roots intact, spray the Roundup first, make sure you get that Roundup at a strong rate down through the whole root system. If you're going to raise soybeans, obviously you haven't raised soybeans on this ground for quite a number of years, so chances are you don't have a lot of rhizobia bacteria that are in the soil. So what we would suggest you do, because keep in mind rhizobia bacteria pull nitrogen out of the air and turn it into a form your plant can use. What we want you to do is double inoculate. I'd probably use a liquid inoculant as well as a dry inoculant. And then I would also put on some nitrogen on this ground, maybe 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen and potentially even more than that. Soybeans need lots of nitrogen if you're going to raise a great crop. Well, the other thing is just to do some good soil sampling, Brian. You talk about putting on a little nitrogen, and that's a no-brainer. You've got a lot of residue out there that's high in carbon and low in nitrogen if you've been growing grasses in your CRP. So to break that down and have the natural process work in your fields, you have to get that carbon to nitrogen ratio down to 12 to 13 parts to one part of nitrogen. Now, if you get enough nitrogen added, you can do that and break that residue down, make those nutrients useful for your crop. But the other nutrients out in your field, 
you know, you've got to look and see what you've got. I don't know what you have in your field and what kind of fertility levels there are. You probably haven't been applying extra fertilizer out there, but again, you've been raising successful perennial crops in your field, and that residue's been breaking down and returning nutrients to the soil. So you may need a whole bunch of nutrition. You may not need that much. Take some good soil samples out in those fields to know for sure. Whether you're raising soybeans or any other crop, we want you to fertilize this ground that is going to come out of CRP. Now let's talk about corn just a little bit. The biggest concern I have if you're going to raise corn is nitrogen tie-up. You apply a bunch of nitrogen and like Darren said, it's going to get tied up. So what I always encourage farmers to do when they're raising corn on corn is use at least an extra 50 pounds of nitrogen beyond what you would in a corn soybean rotation. But if you're corn into CRP ground, you probably need an extra 100 pounds or more nitrogen above and beyond what you would normally do in a corn soybean rotation. When you have ground coming out of CRP, we just strongly encourage you try to avoid tillage as much as you possibly can. Do what you can to raise a good crop this next year by fertilizing, but first you have to soil test to find out what nutrients you're going to need. And don't forget about putting nitrogen out, whether you're raising soybeans or corn or anything, because we're going to have nitrogen tie up in CRP ground. Well, and who knows what kind of weeds you're going to have out there too, Brian. Maybe it's our weed of the week. We'll show you how to control this tough weed coming up next. The Weed of the Week is sponsored by the Enlist Weed Control System from Dow AgroSciences, a new herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate. You work to protect your farm's legacy and to keep it going. Introducing the Enlist Weed Control System, an advanced herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate for exceptional control of tough weeds. The next chapter begins. Our Weed of the Week is brome grass. Now we're standing by the edge of a field and the reason why is because brome usually creeps in from these field borders, whether it's from a ditch or like in this case, a shelter belt. Brome grass can be a major problem out in fields. Well, it certainly can. It's a perennial grass. It can reproduce by rhizome or by seeds. So you'll see these rhizomes shooting out below the ground and then they'll pop new shoots up. And you'll see that right along the edge as Brian was saying. So a lot of farmers will try and do some deep tillage right along the edge to cut off those rhizomes and stop them from getting into the field. But you know what? It's not very effective. You've got to do some chemical control if you want to really stop it. Well, here's what we do on our own farm. We'll literally go around the outside, call it four or six rows, and we'll spray that very early in the season. You'll stop the brome grass and other weeds that are there. Okay, now when we're looking at brome grass, a lot of people say, ah, I'm not very good at identifying one grass from the next. There's one thing that's kind of cool about brome grass that's unique. On the leaf, you'll see a distinctive W or M, depending on which way you're looking at it, if you're looking at it uh, upside, upside down. down or not. Uh, and that's kind of unique to brome grass. So when I see that on the leaf, uh, that's another way that I know that I'm dealing with brome. Pretty scientific way to figure this whole thing out, Darren. So with brome grass, again, it is a perennial. So you can try some of the grass killers, like in soybeans, something like Select Max. You're just gonna suppress this grass. In corn, accent is okay. In wheat, any of the grass killers, all you can hope to do is just kind of burn it back a little bit, suppress it and allow the wheat or any other crop to get growing. There aren't a whole lot of options other than Roundup. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week. That's all the time we've got, but stay tuned. There's more Ag PhD coming up right after this. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. What are farmers doing to feed the planet? They're using Quadtrek technology, soil management, and planting systems from Case IH to foster a better growing environment that maximizes yield potential. Visit CaseIH.com to be ready. With this year's early harvest in the northern part of the country, many farmers got their combines inspected in the fall and took care of replacing any worn parts. But if you didn't, you'll want to listen to this week's Iron Talk. One of the cool things about wintertime is every equipment dealer is looking for work to do in the shop. Now, some of the best shops are really busy and you've got to schedule appointments. Others are really offering some good deals to entice you to come in and get some work done. For example, when it comes to your combine, now's a great time of year to have your combine inspected. Maybe you can do it yourself on the farm and you just need to figure out what parts you need to order, but maybe you want to have a professional look at it at the shop at the equipment dealer. If so, 
look for what deals your equipment dealer is offering. For example, some are offering haul it in for free. They'll come out and get your combine and bring it into the shop at no charge to you. Others are offering a free inspection as long as you're going to buy the parts from that dealer. And finally, if there's deals on parts, now's the best time of year to get them. Think about it. You're not going to use that combine in many cases till either the summer or the fall, depending on what crop you have. So it's exactly the opposite time of year. This is when equipment dealers need to have deals on parts in order to get them moved, and many do have those deals for you. Finally, get your combine inspected now. I know harvest seems like it's a long ways away, but you've got a busy crop season coming up. You don't want to have any last minute surprises or delays when it's time to harvest your next crop. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. Don't miss this year's free Ag PhD Winter Workshops. At Ag PhD, we're all about helping you raise better crops and earn more money on your farm. We'll talk about drought proofing your crop, weed and rootworm resistance, how to improve your fertility program, and on farm trials and field tests. We'll also tell you the good and bad about the new products and technologies on the market and give you our recommendations for pest control and a host of different crops. You'll get some insights on new farm regulations and tax laws going forward. And as always, you'll receive a free agronomy manual. Learn more and sign up today at agphd.com. You expect a lot from this seed, and as it grows through each stage of development, Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers is there, feeding your crop exactly what it needs when it needs it. So no matter how you fertilize, no matter when, AgroLiquid efficiently brings all the nutrients your crop needs for a great harvest. From one kernel in the ground to 600 on the ear. For better yields and better quality, Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers. Speed, strength, and efficiency make Capello corn heads a head above the rest. Built with polymer components that exceed industry standards, Capello corn heads continue to push the boundaries for maximizing grain retention while using less energy. Visit CapelloUSA.com and learn more about Capello's state-of-the-art chopping technology that cuts cleaner, allowing your horsepower to remain where it belongs, with your combine, so you can harvest faster in all weather conditions. Add to that an amazing folding feature and it's clear to see why Capello is a head above the rest. Everything is better to the power of Nutrisphere N. Proven to shield against leaching, volatilization, and denitrification, Nutrisphere N Nitrogen Fertilizer Manager helps you maximize the efficiency of your nitrogen applications. In fact, research shows that in 184 corn trials, Nutrisphere N increases yields by an average of 13.2 bushels per acre. Do the math for yourself. Contact your local fertilizer dealer today and take your operation to the power of Nutrisphere N. Advanced farming systems from Case IH helps producers be ready. Our precision farming solution is less complex and built right into our equipment. Factory integrated with open architecture, AFS works with all of your implements, no matter what color they are. And our team of dedicated specialists are here to keep you rolling 24-7, 365. The world of farming is changing. Will you be ready? I'm ready. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. The all-new S-Cube Commercial Tender is the only tender on the market with poly tanks, giving you the capability to haul seed, fertilizer, water, or liquid fertilizer. Each cube can hold 300 units of seed, 2,000 gallons of liquid, or 300 cubic feet of fertilizer. Options include full-functioning wireless remote, stainless steel conveyors, and self-contained hydraulics. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. That's our time for today, but be sure to join us again next time for another Iron Talk, Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, and much more. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. No one cares more for the environment than family farmers who plan to pass their land down to their children. These same farmers are working to double yields over the next 15 to 20 years to feed the growing world. To learn how they plan to do it, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.